All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again this week as we continue our study in the Gospel of John. Very grateful that you've decided to log on today and watch this Bible class. Hopefully it'll be uplifting for you. We are going to be continuing our discussion of, of the crucifixion of Jesus today. We um, worked our way up through John 19 and verse 27, I believe, and so uh, we are right in the middle of the crucifixion, and we talked a lot about it last week. Um, my goal today is hopefully to get through chapter 19 of John, finish out the chapter. Uh, we'll see if we can get that done or not. Um, so far, what we've seen is, is we've talked about uh, the trial of Jesus, the scourging, the beating of Jesus. We've also talked about the cross and what, what was entailed in that, how how terrible it was and how much suffering the, the victim endured on the cross. It, it was a means of execution. And, um, you know, in modern society, our means of execution are very humane. Um, we try to make it painless when, when we do execute someone, but they tried to make it as horrible as they could and last as long as they could, um, perhaps as a form of deterrent. Uh, so uh, we've talked about it and, and Jesus, we've talked about a few of the things he said on the cross, um, how he prayed for the forgiveness uh, of those who were killing him, how he also talked to the thief next to him and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. We talked about that. And then we also mentioned uh, he committed the care of his mother uh, to John. And John agreed to take care of Mary after Jesus' death. So John 19 now, and beginning of verse 28 and uh, reading through verse 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with the sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Okay, so uh, this... Verses 28 through 30 deal with the death of Jesus and talk and talks a little bit about uh, him thirsting here. Um, several of the things are kind of, uh, John kind of glosses over, not glosses over, but doesn't include in his gospel that are included in the others. Uh, in regard to um, some of the things Jesus said and did while on the cross and things that happened when he, when he did die. On the cross, and so I thought we would go ahead also, and before we uh, talk about this, uh, also look at the Matthew account and see a few more details of some things that happened uh, when Jesus died on the cross. So, going now to Matthew uh, chapter twenty-seven, verses forty-five through fifty-five. <clears throat> Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this is the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were looking on from afar. Okay, now in just a moment we're going to, to talk about um, them offering him the drink, the sour wine. But notice also that Matthew mentions a few more things that happen 
uh, when Jesus died on the cross. He, he mentions the darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. So there were three hours of darkness uh, on the earth at this time. Some people have tried to explain this away, saying there was some kind of solar eclipse or something of that nature. But, you know, even in a solar eclipse, we wouldn't really call it darkness. Uh, the light gets dimmer for a, a short period of time. This was three hours of darkness. So it, it wasn't any kind of eclipse or any kind of natural event. This was a miraculous event that took place. And um, it's interesting that even in some secular writings, we do have mention of a, of a, of a time when the sun went dark for uh, three hours. And so that, that's interesting as well. So there is darkness over the face of the earth. It's interesting that, you know, Jesus is the light of the world. And now as he's dying on the cross, we have that light is, is taken away. He's bearing the sins of mankind. And um, this darkness, in my mind, it, it symbolizes the, um, the fact that God um, has put all of our sins upon Jesus. And Jesus is bearing them on our sins on the cross at this time. Um, there's an earthquake, and we're told that the veil of the temple was torn. Now, I know I've taught this before to those of you who have sat through our Bible classes and whatnot, but this is some of the best imagery. And I never, growing up, never understood the significance and why. Why is the veil in the temple being torn? What does that mean? Well, what it means is simply this. You've got to remember the symbology of the, the whole temple in general. There was the outer court that represents the world that we live in. There is the uh, holy place wherein was the table of showbread, the candlestick, and the altar of incense. That represents the church. And once a year, the high priest would go through the veil in the holy place into the most holy place, uh, which... Only the high priest was allowed to enter into, and there was the Ark of the Covenant, and that was that was symbolic of, of the dwelling of God. So the whole thing, um, the image is that only the high priest was allowed into the most holy place, and that represents heaven. But you had to go through the holy place to get to the most holy place. And so we today... We go from the outer court, the world, into the holy place, the church. And it's through the holy place that we can get into the most holy place, which is heaven. Well, that veil is what separated the holy place from the most holy place. The fact that that veil has now been torn means that the way has been made open for us to get into heaven. And the Hebrew writer even tells us that that veil represents the body of Christ in uh, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, talking about heaven, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. When the body of Jesus was broken on the cross and he died, that his body then opened the way into heaven for all who are redeemed by his blood. So the symbology there is beautiful. The way into heaven has been opened for mankind, and that was through the body of Jesus. So the symbology there of that, that veil being torn from top to bottom um, represents the way to heaven being opened. So, so wonderful to think of that. And we're also told that um, during this earthquake, the, the rocks were split and that the the um, graves of many of the saints were opened. Now, if, if you look back, uh, it doesn't actually say that they were resurrected right then, that those saints were. Uh, again, if you look back, uh, it says in verse 53, coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city. So when Jesus dies, the earth, there's the earthquake and the graves are open, but the saints don't actually come forth from that, from those graves until after Jesus has been resurrected. But at this point, those graves then, then have been opened. 
and eventually they're going to come forth. Now, in regard to the resurrection of, of some of these saints, notice not all, it says some of the saints. Um, you know, the, God doesn't indulge us uh, to tell us perhaps, you know, who it was that came forth, how long they hung around, of what happened to them. We're not told any of that. We, we're not meant to know that, so God didn't tell us that. But we can believe and know that those saints did uh, come forth after Jesus' resurrection. Okay, so uh, again, going back to our passage in John uh, chapter 19, uh, John says that, you know, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Jesus said, I thirst. We shouldn't take that to mean that when Jesus said, I thirst, he was just saying that to fulfill prophecy. Um, that's not what, I don't think that's what John meant. Um, you know, there there were prophecies that were given that implied and stated, though, that when he died on the cross, he would suffer from thirst. And and certainly he did. Psalm 69, 21. Uh, they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst. They gave me vinegar uh, to drink. And so there were prophecies foretelling that he was going to be thirsty. So this statement by John, it just it emphasizes that those prophecies were correct and that he did indeed thirst while he was on the cross. And that was um, another aspect of his torture. Um, you know, during all of this, he he just wanted a drink of, of water and they wouldn't even give him that. They gave him sour wine to drink uh, at that point. Now, John's statement that Jesus received the sour wine, I don't think we should take that to mean that he actually drank it. Um, notice it's careful to say that uh, John is careful to say that, you know, they put it to his mouth, but it never says that he actually drank it says he received it. Matthew tells us that toward the beginning of his crucifixion, they offered him some wine to drink at that point too. Uh, in Matthew 27 and verse 34, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he would not drink. So I take that to be kind of what's happening here at the end now of his crucifixion. They've offered him that basically the same thing to drink again. He receives it in that they put it to his mouth and he, he tastes it and realizes what it is and, and he doesn't drink it. Now, why, why is that important? Well, I think it's, it's important because, remember, Jesus had said to his disciples when he instituted the Lord's Supper that he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until he drank it with them in the kingdom of God. In Matthew uh, chapter 26 in verse 29, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So this was a, a prophecy, a prediction by Jesus that he wasn't going to drink the fruit of the vine until he did it in the kingdom. So if he had partaken of this sour wine while he was on the cross, he would have broken his word to his disciples at that point. And then... Um, we have Jesus' words, it is finished. What exactly was finished at this time when Jesus uttered these words? Um, his suffering was finished, okay? He, he, he's about to die. And so his suffering, his time of torture is, is finished. His life as a normal yeah, he was never really normal, but as a as a human being, it was finished. Okay, uh, the work that he came to do as a man has been finished at this point, and the atonement for sin was finished. He has completed it now. You know, again, how much he dreaded it, knowing what he was going to endure, and he didn't want to endure it. But now he's able to say, "It's finished. I'm done. The hard part's over, so to speak." Um, here on the cross. I, we should not take that statement to mean that all of his work was done. Um, he still had work to do, and he really still is working today. Um, we know that after he says it is finished and he his spirit goes to paradise, um, after he's resurrected, we're told that he appears to his disciples for a period of, of 40 days. He makes appearances 
Um, he's also, you know, he's still going to ascend to his father, the right hand of his father. And he's still going to work with his disciples. Um, you remember in Mark chapter 16, when Jesus uh, gave the Great Commission, he told them to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And then he talks about the signs that would follow those who believe. He talks about uh, casting out demons, speaking with new tongues, taking serpents, uh, drink anything deadly and it won't hurt them, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. But then in verse 19, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. Notice, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. So the Lord continued to work with his disciples through the signs that they were doing uh, in spreading the gospel and, and spreading uh, his kingdom. So really his work was not completely done, but that portion, that part of his work was done. His life as a man, his sacrifice for the sins of mankind, that sacrifice has now been made. There's still work to do, um, but that part has been completed at that point. And what a relief that must have been for Jesus to, to finally have that, you know, done and, and finished. Okay, we're going to go on now a little bit further here in John. We're going to read verses uh, 31 through 37. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Okay, John mentions here in verse 31 that it was the preparation day. The preparation day was the day before the Sabbath. And the Jews did not want these men to still be hanging on the cross when the Sabbath day finally came. Now, John mentions that this Sabbath was a high day. What does that mean? Well, there were some Sabbaths that were not on Saturday. And that's because some of the feasts um, that God instituted with the children of Israel had certain days that were set aside as holy days and those were considered Sabbaths as well. For example, um, in Leviticus chapter 23 verses 4 through 7, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now notice, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall do no customary work on it. So on the first day of, of this uh, feast, uh, it was a, a, a holy convocation, a holy gathering, and they were to do no, do no work. And so it was considered to be a, a Sabbath. Now, when a regular Sabbath day also coincided with one of these special Sabbath days, that was called a high day because it was sort of doubly a Sabbath. Uh, it was a seventh day of the week and also one of these um, holy days that are set apart uh, in the, these laws given by God. So that's what John means when he says that it, it was a high day. Um, so the Jews, in order to, um, hasten the death of those who were on the cross, um, they asked that their legs be broken. Now, as we mentioned last, last week, the ultimate cause of death on the cross was, uh, suffocation. If you survived everything else, you didn't have a heart attack or pass a, a clot, 
or, or something like that, um, you would eventually suffocate. Um, the weight distributed on the chest when hanging from your hands, it makes it difficult to breathe pro properly and your lungs fill with fluid. And the only relief, the only way that a person could breathe properly was if they were to lift up with their legs and relieve the pressure off of their, their chest area. And so um, when they wanted to, when you had somebody who was just, they wanted to finish it and get it over with, they would break the legs uh, of those people on the cross and they would do it with a large hammer. Can you imagine how much that would hurt? Um, but so in order to speed up the death uh, of those on the cross, they would break the legs. And so the Jews ask uh, that that be done to Jesus, go and break their legs so we can get those bodies off the cross. It's, you know, the Sabbath is coming up. You have to wonder if perhaps the Pharisees um, uh, had a secondary motive. Maybe they knew the prophecies. Maybe they knew that, you know, not one bone should be broken of the Messiah, and they wanted to prove that Jesus wasn't the Messiah by breaking uh, his bones. Um, in Psalm uh, 3420, it says, He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. So, you know, if they could have succeeded in breaking one of Jesus' bones, they could have said, See, he's not the Messiah. Uh, he did not fulfill that prophecy. But their plan backfired. Um, and in the process of them trying to cause Jesus to break a prophecy, they actually fulfilled another. And that was the, that if you look at Zechariah 12 and verse 10, I will pour on them the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on him whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And so um, the prophecy there, they will look on him whom they pierce. We learn that that's messianic. And so here they are trying to discredit Jesus and make him break a prophecy. But in, the, in, in reality, what they're doing is they're just fulfilling more and showing even more clearly that Jesus is um, the son of God. Okay, we are running, starting to run out of time. I think we've got about five minutes left. Let's go ahead and, and read the, the last part here of John chapter 19. Probably not going to finish talking about it, but we'll read it now. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who had first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Okay, so Jesus has died. Okay, he, he, he gave up his spirit and, and that's what death is. It's the spirit leaving the physical body and the body without the spirit is dead. So it's finished. His work as a man is done. His spirit has gone to paradise. And now we have, we're introduced to a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea was just, it was a town in Judea. Um, the exact location of that town is not really known uh, where it is, but um, when you look at the different gospel accounts, it's interesting that Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in every one of the accounts uh, of the gospels. And we learn a little uh, other little tidbits of information about Joseph from these other passages. So uh, we'll look at some of them in Matthew chapter 27. When evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea, so we learn he's rich, named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate commanded the body be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, uh, he wrapped it in, in 
clean linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb, which was hewn out of rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Okay, so that's Matthew's account. We learn there that he's a, a wealthy man. And again, he goes and asks for the body of Jesus. Um, and Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 43, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but the, the other bit tidbit of information we get from, from Mark is that uh, he was a prominent council member. Okay, so um, he was a, a member of the council. And then in Luke chapter 23, uh, verses 50 to 52, um, we learn here, Luke says, a certain man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. And he had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea. And it says that also he was waiting for the kingdom of God. So we learned some things about Joseph. He was a disciple of Jesus, but he was a disciple in secret. We'll talk about that here in a minute. He was a member of the council. This would have been the, the Sanhedrin council. And uh, Luke says he was a good man. He was a just man and he waited for the kingdom of God. And so this man was a disciple of Jesus. He believed the teachings of Jesus and he deserves credit for that. But he was a disciple in secret. Um, why in secret? Well, it, it's pretty obvious that, you know, to care, to confess Jesus publicly, to, to follow him, carried very real consequences. We're blessed to live in a country and in a time where we can confess Christ and we don't really suffer persecution here in this country though some places in the world you would um, it seems likely that for him to publicly confess Jesus would have cost him greatly um, he held a position on the Sanhedrin council he was wealthy and he probably feared the Jews and feared what would happen if he openly confessed Jesus you remember uh, in John chapter 9, we have Jesus healed the blind man and the uh, Pharisees, they go and they talk to the blind man's parents and blind man's parents are very careful in how they talk to the Pharisees because uh, in John 9, 22, it says his parents said these things because they, because they feared the Jews. The, the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. That was... That was a powerful tool um, the Jews had, the, the religious leaders, to put people out of the synagogue, and they used that to coerce people. And so they they were afraid. Oh, man, my nose is itching. I'm about to sneeze. Forgive me if I do. At least you don't have to worry about me infecting you over the Internet. And then um, John chapter... Oh, did I miss one? Yeah, I missed one of my passages. So I'll go ahead and read it. In John chapter 12, uh, 42 and 43, it says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So yes, people feared the Jews, and that's probably part of the reason that up until this point, <clears throat> Joseph had been a disciple in secret. Uh, I, I don't think that that is a... Um, commendable characteristic that he was in secret he was uh, perhaps a little timid and fearful where he shouldn't be again jesus warned us and don't fear those who kill the body but can't hurt the soul can't kill the soul fear him who's able to, to destroy both soul and body in hell i understand that's easy for me to say living in, in the year 2020 in the united states um, but you know it's not good that he was a disciple in secret however I do think he deserves to be commended because it, he took courage. Again, the, the passage in Mark 15 and verse 43 says that he took courage. So when he sees Jesus suffering on the cross and, and he sees the horrible things that were done to him, that finally, you know, that you might call it the straw that broke the camel's back, whatever. It was, it was the event that uh, finally made him come out in the open and acknowledge that, you know, uh, he was a disciple of Jesus. He could no longer remain quiet. And so he requests the body of Jesus, and he receives it. Of course, we also know uh, from our passage here that Nicodemus 
also at this point helps him and they prepare the body of Jesus for burial. They wrap it in linen. They would have anointed the body. Again, now uh, in the in the next chapter, we're going to see the women coming to do pretty much what they've already done on the first day of the week. They're not going to get to do it because Jesus will have already been resurrected. But um, they prepare the body. The body is put into a new tomb. Again, fulfillment of prophecy uh, that was uttered in regard to that. And um, we have made it through John chapter 19. Um, the crucifixion of Jesus and his burial. Thankfully, the story of Jesus does not end there. Uh, in my reading today, I, I, I came across a statement that um, Thomas Jefferson, and he in his translation of the Bible, he stopped the gospel here and because he did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And so he ended the story of Jesus here with him going into the tomb, not him coming out of the tomb in chapter 20. Thankfully, the story of Jesus does not end here. Um, he's going to be resurrected, and we'll get into that next week. Again, thank you for um, watching today. hope this has been helpful for you. We will um, pick up in chapter 20 next week. Hope you're all doing well. Hope everyone's okay. If you need anything, please let us know. We'll be glad to help you uh, in any way that we can. So everybody take care. God bless. Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday if you can make it.